everyone, and welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Ivana Tay, and I'm so excited to host Sarah LaFleur, the CEO and founder of MM LaFleur today. For those who, of you who don't know, MM LaFleur is a New York-based women's wear uh, styling company and community founded on the mission of making it easier to get ready for work and taking the work out of it. Um, my relationship, funny enough, with MM LaFleur starts back a couple years ago uh, when I actually saw a fellow Googler come out of the women's restroom wearing one of the trench coats. Of course, this prompted a search online where I learned about the brand and Sarah's journey as a founder. So I'm so elated to welcome Sarah LaFleur today. Hey, hey Sarah. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Of course. Good. Where are you dialing in from? Um, we are um, we are in uh, Connecticut, actually. Um, we live in New York, but my my husband and I were were expecting a baby in the next month, and yes. um, we had we had a baby moon plan, which obviously um, you know among the circumstances canceled, and so we rented an Airbnb for a week. Um, and decided to just escape the city for a little bit, and it's yes. first time out of the city since I <laughs> down, and it's um, I see trees. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's a farm next door, so um, I, I'm enjoying this like brief moment outside of uh, New York uh, before before um, I become a mom for the first time. Yay, that's so exciting. Well, I'm very envious, and I'm glad you're getting some some fresh air out of the city and. Super stoked to have you here today. So I think we've got a lot of really cool, um, exciting things to cover. And just for the viewers to know, I think there's a lot we can discuss about, obviously, your journey as a founder, uh, what it's been like for you to raise capital as you were building the business. I uh, would love to get your perspective on fashion and e-com, especially in the age of COVID. And then yeah. lastly, we'll touch on your leadership philosophy, which I think has always been uh, quite interesting. So we'll start from the very beginning. Um, <laughs> In your mid to late 20s, you had, by your mid to late 20s, you'd worked in consulting at Bain, then you spent some time in TechnoServe in South Africa, and then you also worked in private equity. Um, so you've quite a, a spectrum of, you know, work experiences. <laughs> what pro what was the impetus for you to then quit your job and, and start your company? Yeah, my mom always makes fun of me, and she, she says that I um, have a career bipolarism where I <laughs> one end to the uh, the other. Um, so yes, it's true. I kind of, you know, I, I was kind of in this very um, corporate sector being at Bain and swung to the other side, um, yes. working for a nonprofit down in South Africa, which uh, also loved and then came back and, and tried my hand at private equity and then, and then now um, and launching MM. So yeah, it's, it's uh, I think, you know, I'm, 36 now, but I, I think if I could just reflect on my 20s for a second, I, for me, it was marked with a lot of, I think, um, just existential angst about what I wanted to do with my life. And I think very specifically my career, um, yes. you know, I, I, I think I've since learned that there's there's more to life than than your job, but um, I'm, I'm sure many of you can relate. I, in my 20s, I mean, my my job was everything. My career was everything, and I think through my career, I thought that's where I would make my mark. And so, I was in constant search for you know this this dream job. And and so, I think the result is I ended up trying a lot of different things that I thought uh, maybe I would be um, good at. And, and most, I think, most importantly, actually, you no, know, it, it was less so what I was good at, and more so what I thought um, would would allow me to to have a, an impact. Um, and I think ultimately, uh, you know, I, I never planned to be an entrepreneur. Maybe I should start there. Mm -hmm. um, my mom is and was a. Uh, an entrepreneur, and so it's it's not as though the concept was foreign to me. But um, right. you know, I th I think through her, I just saw how difficult it was, uh, and um, and so I never in in my career plan thought I like oh, an entrepreneur. That's what I want to be. Uh, that was right. never in the in the in the plan, and it it really. I think what happened ultimately was that I, I left um, my last job, which was in private equity, um, really not being in such a good place. I think I, you know, I moved back from South Africa thinking, OK, this is going to be um, this is going to be the job that's for me, uh, which ultimately turned out not to be. And uh, <laughs> and I quit without a, a plan. 
um, uh, you know, just kind of turned in my two weeks notice, went cold turkey, and then, you know, was was trying to figure out what to do with my life next. And and um, and and that's where entrepreneurship came up. Uh, but I wouldn't even say it was entrepreneurship. I, I had an idea for a business. I you know I wasn't that yeah. like, well, now I'm going to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. Right. You had a there was a problem that you wanted to solve, which I'm sure stemmed also from you you know, dressing for work in private equity or when it was back in uh, consulting at Bain. So mm -hmm. once you quit your job, which I'm sure takes a ton of guts to do, right? It's a very mm -hmm. scary thing to, to pull the trigger. What followed next? So you were, you know, free, so to speak, um, yeah. had probably more time and to think about these things. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I quit um, and uh, I, I think I, I cried for a good month. And a half. That's actually, I particularly remember doing that as I watched, you know, re reruns of Grey's Anatomy. Um, as I, one I, does. Yeah, as one does. Yeah, I was not in a good place. I think, um, you know, having just spent this, um, all, all this kind of mental energy psyching myself up, thinking that this was going to be the thing. Um, uh, I, I was really not um, mentally in, in a great place. Uh, the idea that I always had, as Ivana, you mentioned, was um, just an, like a, an idea for better workwear. Um, and so having been at Bain and then in private equity and even during my time um, working in nonprofits, you know, there were various occasions that called for dressing up and for, for yes. showing up. And um, there were always these kind of contemporary run of the mill brands that I would go to buy these pieces. And uh, I really found myself spending a lot of money for clothes that I didn't particularly like or think were well made. Um, right. And, and, uh, and I think my mother, my mother worked in high end fashion. So through her, I got to see and touch a lot of beautiful pieces that she would bring back. Um, not because she bought them, but it was because it was part of her job. And and so, you know, she taught me a lot about good fit and tailoring and, and dressing. And, um, I, I just, I think that that's when I thought to myself, like, you know, where, where is this level of quality for, uh, your average working woman? Um, that's really, that's, that's the idea that I, that I had been kind of nursing with me, um, since, since I had my first job. Um, and I thought, you know, at some point, someone will do something about this or, you know, maybe I'll do it when I retire. Uh, but I think just um, at that point, not really knowing what was next for me, I thought mm -hmm. maybe this is the right time to actually go and work on it. Um, and so that, that was the that was the origin of, of MM. Nice. And if not you, then who, right? <laughs> yeah, I you know. But to be honest, not at all, because I come at it from a customer perspective, but my, my education in fashion was, you know, nil. Like I, I had never gone to design school. I had never gone to merchandising school. I mean, I don't think of myself as having, um, I don't think I have poor taste in fashion, but I'm, I'm definitely, you know, not a, not a fashion obsessive. And so mm -hmm. I, if you had asked any of my, like, close friends from college, you know, would, would Sarah be running a, a, a fashion tech startup, you know, 10 years from now, most sure. of them have been like, well, no way. Like she's <laughs> never impressed in it. So it's yeah. so funny how life turns out sometimes. I think, you know, some people would say also what it takes to be a good founder or a good leader is to be able to recognize where your strengths may lie and then finding other folks who can complement you know, other areas. So if designing wasn't your necessarily your skill set, your wheelhouse, you know, you went out and you saw it, um, a designer to come through. So what was that process like for you to recruit for the company? Yeah, Yvonne, that's such a that's such a good point. Um, never try to do everything yourself. <laughs> <laughs> a lesson in life, but for sure, uh, you know, it's something that's I think true in in entrepreneurship. Um, yeah, so I, you know, my title is founder and CEO. Um, but I have uh, a co-founder and a chief creative officer. Um, her name is Miyako Nakamura. She was the former head designer at Zach Posen. Just an incredible design talent. Um, 
you know, the connection that we oddly have is we, um, well, I'm half Japanese and she's Japanese. So we both grew up in Japan and people think that we actually met through somehow, you know, the J Japan connection, but actually we, we met, met through a headhunter in New York, a fashion headhunter in New York, because, you know, as I was referencing before, I, I didn't know anybody in fashion. I, I didn't work in fashion. So, right. um, she was someone who I met through this, you know, interview process um after interviewing dozens of candidates um my headhunter actually said you know I, I was actually already set on someone else and he said you know i think there's one more woman you should meet i think you guys would really hit it off and i and i was like ah, i'm you know I, i'm already quite happy with this other person that i found um and he was like no 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 just trust me meet with her um and uh yeah it, you know as they say the rest is history but there, i think there was some sort of kind of um instinctive connection that we had i think she was mostly just amused um <laughs> you know, as she would say she um she thought there like every single piece of clothing that needed to be designed in the world had already been designed and here i was coming to her saying hey here's this whole market of working women um, yeah. who want beautiful tailored clothes but they care a lot about practicality and wrinkle resistance and ease of care mm -hmm. and washability and absolutely you know, yeah, there, there, there really aren't clothes like that out there. Like, right. would you, would you want to do this with me? And um, I think for someone like her who had been designing for the runway and for the Oscars and you know just a variety of these couture gowns, this was a, a different challenge for her. And so um, you know that that's that's ultimately how we ended up coming together. But uh, a lot of serendipity there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would you say, so, since you both have this sort of shared um, Japanese descent, did that play any role in influencing um, the styles of the clothing you're producing or perhaps the nature of the brand? Yeah, you know, um, I think when I specifically called about the need for this, more of this kind of clothing, she understood because in Japan there was, there is a market for this kind of um I shouldn't say there's a market. There, there are fashion brands who really do cater for this women and think a lot about practicality. You know, um, mm -hmm. like Uniqlo, I um, is a brand that I respect a lot. Um, also, yep. a Japanese brand. And if you think about a lot of the innovation that they've had in their clothing, whether it's heat tech or airism, you know, I, I think there's um, something that's pretty uh, innate in Japanese culture is this desire to innovate. And it mm -hmm. really extends into clothing as well. So when I when I talked to her about creating these pieces for working women that wasn't just about looking good and being tailored and being well made, it was also about all these other practical elements. I think she she kind of um, instinctively understood what it is that I was I was trying to get at. Um, so I think that's one connection that that uh, like, or I should say one kind of context that that. Sure. She gra grasped immediately. Um, I, I think the other thing is, um, I, I, you know, she is uh, full Japanese and I'm half Japanese. And I, I grew up actually, I spent most of my, my childhood in Japan. And so I think what was really special about us connecting, you know, and being in New York, right? We're immigrants in New yeah, York. Of course. And um, suddenly we find ourselves talking to each other in Japanese. And I, I think. Um, and she's also fluent in English as well. And I think somehow both of us feel that we're um, our a hundred percent self when we're able to kind of just go back and forth in these two languages. Um, and, and so that's that was quite special and unique, you know, because I think most people that we interact with really only see one one side of us, you know, the Japanese yeah. or the the American side. Yes, oh, I love that. I love that you can bring this authentic version of yourself to work and it, and how it's so deeply embedded into the brand that you've built. Um, I recall, I think one aspect of Emma LaFleur is the bento box, right? Which is part of yeah. the, the styling service, which is, yeah. is definitely Japanese influenced. Um, sure. I remember reading that was sort of born out of a, a business decision to pivot from not just selling direct on your site, but you found an opportunity to open up the sort of subscription service. Um, so was that born out of any particular obstacle that came about as you were, you know, building the company or how did you decide to kind of bake that into the company? Yeah, we, um, you know, so we, the company was founded in 2013 
And so we've we've gone through various stages, um, and you know, to use the the tech term pivot, um, you know, we've yeah, of course several <laughs> times in business. Um, but the the Bento was probably one of the biggest pivots that we've ever had as a company. I think first when we first launched in 2013, um, really the the heyday of um, a lot of these uh, direct to consumer brands that were, or I shouldn't say heyday, first wave, no, or maybe second wave, you know, whatever it was, <laughs> um, really like Warby Parker and Everlane, those were arriving on the scene and, and gaining a lot of traction. And so, I mean, from the outside, it looked so easy. I was like, gosh, all you need to do is put a bunch of product on your e comm site. And next thing you know, you're like a million. Branding, boom, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, really, I think na very naively, uh, uh, launched an e-commerce site, um, and and long story short, it it, um, it really wasn't working. Um, mm -hmm. I think part of the challenge was that our products weren't cheap. Um, I think uh, you know I, I think our clothes are phenomenal value. We're using best quality fabric and from Italy, Germany, Japan, um, making them in uh, the, these top-notch factories and really putting an emphasis on on quality, but it's very hard to tell that story online. And so, you know, our dresses cost anywhere from 165 to 295. And, and to, to get a customer to, to pull the trigger on something like that, especially back in 2013, you know, now, yeah. nowadays, I, you know, people buy Pelotons on, on site. <laughs> That's so, true. Right. So it's, it's, I think e-com has also evolved a lot, but back in 2013, it was, a, it was a tall order to get, um, to convince women to buy a, a $250 dress um, without trying it on. And, and so mm -hmm. really it was, um, it was a moment of desperation that ultimately led us to this, um, to Bento and the Bento was, um, it, it was, it was very different from just shopping for yourself online. You would come to our site, fill out a survey. And based on that, our stylist would place, uh, in a box that looked like a bento box, which is why we called it the bento, um, uh, pieces that we thought would work best for our customer. Um, and uh, that, uh, I, you know, I, I think there are a lot of things that that made that model work. But I think one of the most important things was customers weren't actually deciding whether to buy a $250 dress there on the spot. You know, we were saying, we'll send it to you. You can try it on. And yeah. only after you've tried it on, um, do you have to actually, you know, decide whether to keep it or not? And um, so I think it just eliminated a lot of that friction that a lot of, you know, a lot of people feel, feel when they're e comm shop I, online shopping. I mean, I think this still happens today, right? How many browsers yes. do you have open? How many cards have you filled? And then ultimately not made it to checkout because of that, that um, hesitation. And I think the Bento mm -hmm. really, um, had a way of taking that element away. Um, so when we launched the Bento, so we launched our site 2013, we launched Bento mid 2014. And, and I mean, to this day, it was really one of the most kind of shocking moments of running the company because our revenue tripled overnight um, when we launched Bento. Yeah. And it, yeah, it was, it was really, um, and it was just, it was such a, in some ways, such a simple change, right? Nothing about our products to change, nothing about our price or our branding or our value proposition mm -hmm. to change at all. It was really just how we were selling the product to her, to the customer that, that, yeah. that, that led to this, this explosion. So, um, yeah, it's, um, you know, uh, what very early on when, when we were first, um, fundraising, we were, I remember Andrew Rosen, uh, founder uh, and former CEO of Theory. It's a long story, but he um, he happened to we happened to just briefly kind of converse, and someone said, "Hey, Andrew, what do you think about the dresses? Um, you know, our dresses?" And he said, um, "It doesn't matter what I think about the dress. It's all about how you sell it." Mm -hmm. uh, and at the moment, I, I didn't quite understood understand what he meant, uh, but that line always stuck with me and. I think it was only really after launching Bento that I was like, huh, that's what he meant, you know? <laughs> so maybe it was actually quite serendipitous. Um, you know, you're meeting the customers where they are and you're by doing that, you're elevating the shopping experience. So yeah. it was a smart move after all. Yeah, yeah, it was, um, it was definitely, it was a lot of learning about her and, and, and what, what we call her Samantha internally. That's, that's yeah. the name we've given 
our customer, but um, you know, she we don't she's not a she's not a fashion obsessive. She's not a fashion icon. She she cares about looking great, but but she wants she wants it to be easy. Um, yeah. She wants it to be practical, and I think that 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 business model just kind of really fit right right with what she was looking for at the time. Yeah. You touched on something, which I think was a is a great uh, segue actually to talk about mm -hmm. how you approached funding the company. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know we have a lot of viewers who may be aspiring entrepreneurs themselves, and funding is a big part of sure. the process. So yeah. you had started the company with 35 grand of your own money and 35 grand from your parents. Yeah, was that enough to get started? It actually was. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, it's funny. You just reminded me of a story when I, I met with um, an, another uh, woman who was also starting a company around the same time. And she was talking about um, using this very prestigious uh, web development company, uh, you know, kind of really the one of the really trendy ones that you want to get in with if you have a DTC company. And um, she was like, yeah, you know, just that that'll cost you around $200,000. And I just remember hearing that. And I was like, Oh my gosh, like what, like, what am I doing? Cause I've got yeah, a lot <laughs> and I'm, 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 I told my front end developer, I could, I think I could pay her 10 and our back end 20. And, um, you know, so I think at that point I was like, like, wow, my, my expectations and my budget are so wildly off. Like how am I ever going to pull this off? And, um, mm -hmm. It, it turns out it, it it was enough for for the first prototype. Like even Miyako, you know, I, I'm quite candid with the amount of money that I spent um, because I I think there's there's just so much mystery surrounding it when when mm -hmm. they say, well, you know the so and so started this company from from nothing, but you're like, but what's right. really nothing? Um, and seventy yeah. k isn't nothing. It's a, it's I mean, you know, it, it still is a lot of money. And back yeah. then, I mean, I literally took my entire savings and I just put it in. <gasps> oh, gosh. I, you know, I had zero dollars left in my in my my savings account. Um, but I paid Miyako, I think, $10,000. That was my initial offer. I said, you know, will you design seven dresses for me? Uh, it's a freelance project. It's 10 k um, And even the developers, you know, who... Um, the actually our back end developer ended up becoming our lead engineer and was with the company for gosh ultimately like 6 years you know it was um it was really a, a really um magical relationship and and so i think i think the point is like you can get a lot done with very little money um yes. and sometimes i think just even you know we're we're a much bigger company now but um it's a it's it's a it's a it's a good reminder um the budgets don't have to keep getting bigger, uh, even if your company <laughs> keeps getting uh, bigger. Um, I think there there are always scrappy ways to to get things done, and you know, not to start talking about COVID too much, but I, I sure. think that's a e even even COVID has been a reminder of things that that can be really scrappily done. Yeah, yeah, that's I think that's very true, and that's very reassuring also for anyone who wants to start something and is concerned that money might be a hindrance. Mm -hmm. um, I think on that note, in the past, you've expressed that entrepreneurship and venture capital is sort of a game for those who are well connected. Mm. Um, looking back last year, I think most, the female founded companies received less than 3% of total VC funds. So, yeah. um, you know, yeah. there's definitely a big gap to fill there. What advice do you have for female founders? Yeah. I mean, this is such a tough one because it's, it's the advice that yeah. needs to be given is really to the, the VCs and the environment that surrounds financing and not to female founders. I think Perfect. one thing that the personal, um, pet peeve of mine where they keep saying like, well, female founders need to like, learn to act like the male founders. And I'm just like, but why? Like, why? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I listen to, to I mean, I'm, I'm overly generalizing here, but you know, when, when they, when they tell female founders to act more like the male founders, they'll say, you know, you know, just uh, essentially the message is be overly confident and, you know, paint a picture, even if you know, you can't actually deliver the numbers. And I'm like, well, that doesn't seem like a great trait to have in a business. <laughs> right. So, 
um, you know, I have a lot of questions around that, that myth. And, um, and so when women, you know, come to me saying I'm, I'm having so much trouble fundraising, um, you know, often I, I just want to shake them and say like, it has nothing to do with you. Um, right. It might be incredible. I'm sure you're a phenomenal business person, but um, the system is, is rigged against you. So yes. um, I think that's, uh, you know, that, that's a little bit of, of a reality check that I, 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 I say, um, because I, I don't want women to always be kind of looking inward. I think, I think my, I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell, you know, I'll just speak from my experience. My, I, I was always kind of saying like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with my presentation? You know, blah, blah, blah. And then I did, I remember one VC, um, who to this day, like, I, you know, I really, I appreciate that he was so candid with me and, and we have a really great relationship. Um, he said to me, you know, it's not you, it's us. We're, we're four guys sitting around a table. And like, we just honestly, we don't have a, we can't get a gut instinct for your product because we don't use your product. And mm. um, that was like the most truthful feedback I think I could have gotten um, of all the VCs that I, I, you know, I was interacting with the majority were, were men. So um, I think that that just has to be said. Um, right. And, and that, you know, I mean, I was really, I've now, you know, we've moved on to bigger rounds. And so it, I would say there's, there's less sexism, I think in the later rounds, because you've got a lot of data to kind of back up what it is that you have built. Um, but in the initial rounds, the seed rounds, the, even the series A rounds, I think those mm -hmm. are really difficult because a lot of what you're doing is asking um, the investors to, you know, find it in their gut to believe it in your product, to believe in you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I, and the other thing I will also say is, um, you know, is your business, does it really require VC funding? Um, VC funding is for a very particular kind of company. It's really, it's not for, it's not for the majority of companies. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I say friends and family, but uh, the friends and family round, um, but that, you know, it's not that everyone has wealthy friends and family. And I think sure. when uh, raising funds is always a game for the well-connected. Um, that well-connected, I, I use broadly, like working at Google, that means you're well-connected, right? And, it's true. and yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of us. <laughs> exactly. So like, you know, you use your Google network um, to the fullest extent. You know, one of my first um, investors was um, a, a former partner that I worked for at Bain. You know, that was a, that was a real, um, you know, he, he knew I had, I had, I was a hard worker. Um, I was on his case for, I think, you know, 18 months altogether. And so um, even though he didn't interact with me day to day, he, he kind of believed that I, I would, I would deliver. Um, and so I think the first thing, if you're thinking about starting a business, um, don't even look to VC initially, just kind of look at your initial network to see if you can put around together. Um, and working at Google is a, just a, a big, big advantage. Well, I think that's very sound advice. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about, you know, the future of fashion and e-commerce, especially in the age of COVID. Yeah. So, you know, when the virus was first breaking out in Asia, I'm sure your, um, your, your partners and your suppliers were at the forefront. So you must have been receiving some of the comms. What were the thoughts that were going through your head around what the implications were for your business? Yeah, you know, Ah, I still, I still wonder how we could have prepared better. Um, I think truthfully we were naive. I think, um, even I think a lot of businesses were caught off guard, right? So <laughs> <laughs> you're not alone. I think, um, you know, even with, with, with SARS or MRSA or all these other, or, um, uh, you know, just uh, all these, all these, uh, pandemics that have happened, I think the, uh, the U S was relatively sheltered from, from all of them. And so even when COVID first started becoming an issue, really, I mean, in China, when we really first started hearing about it was when our factories had to close in January and February. And so we knew our spring delivery our spring collection was being delayed and we were planning around that, but it was still a problem afar. Right. And, um, right my family lives in Japan. And so um, I'm, I'm sure many of you remember the, the princess cruise, how could we forget, you know? And so that was happening in Japan. And so 
I was hearing about it from my parents, but I just, you know, again, it, it felt like, it felt like it, it, well, this will be another thing that, you know, like, like Ebola, it'll affect that continent, but not, not ours. Um, and then I think in, in mid February, when it became clear that it was going to hit us too, we started scenario planning. Um, but I think, you know, we weren't thinking this was the 1918 Spanish flu. We were thinking <laughs> this would be a, a momentary blip where maybe we had to close our stores um, for a few weeks. I think even in our worst case scenario, we said um, we would have to close 75% of our stores, but um, they would only close for eight weeks. And uh, and Mart when I think it was the, the Friday before everything kind of, I'm sorry, the Monday before everything closed in New York City, we had one of our best sales days in, um, in our stores. And so we were saying like, huh, this COVID thing, it's not going to affect us all that much. <laughs> and then fri by Friday, we closed all of our stores. Um, and so it was, it was kind of, it was dramatic, you know, how yeah. things shifted. Um, and, and even in that, I remember even then when we said, okay, we're going to close our stores, the plan was to reopen all of them by June because I, I you know, I, I think, I don't think it was just us. I think everyone thought June was going to be this magical month when things were going to reopen. And, and clearly that just hasn't been the case. So I think it's been a real lesson for us and, and for me personally in, um, in not in, in having a plan and never sticking to it um, in the sense that um, your plan needs to be constantly changing. And so I think yeah. every single day my executive team is getting together and trying to piece together new data um, I think just even this week, you know, our understanding is that um, we have a store in San Francisco that we were really um, excited to reopen and um, in talks to open another one in Barcadero. Yes. And uh, and now Cal numbers in California are going up, you know. And so that that's that's data that's just changed in in less than a week. Uh, right. So we're really learning to. Um, we're learning, we're learning to make different decisions every day. I think that that's as plainly as I can put it. Yeah. And I, that's fair. I think there's just a ton of unpredictability at this mm -hmm. point in time. So it's, it's really hard to say, you know, or have any foresight, you know, months into the future. Yeah. Um, but I suppose, you know, beyond opening um, some stores, are you perhaps thinking about new product lines or um, I think you had, actually done a very successful job of rebranding a pair of work pants that you had and the joggers. <laughs> yeah, Colby joggers, formerly known as the Col Colby uh, origami suiting pants. Yes, there yeah. you go. Yeah, there you go. No, no, so that's, um, yeah, it's true. I mean, I think one of the things that we were saying is, um, well, you know, we, we've, we never really call ourselves a workwear company. We've always said we're a company for working women. So, mm -hmm. I mean, as you can see right now, like, even though we're not in a physical office, you know, we're yes. both women who are working and, um, you know, I, it's funny. I, we, we were just in, um, interviewed in the New York times yesterday about zoom tops. And I, I said, this is my, <laughs> top, actually. this is my Chadwick top. I have literally, I have this literally in four colors and I have them stacked next to my <laughs> Um, and every time I have um, a call, a very special call like this, I sure. pull this out and I pull out my statement earrings and I call it a day. Um, nice. But, you know, it, it's um, I think even though uh, we're not physically in an office, it's not as though our clothing needs have gone out the door. And, and one of the things that I yeah. think we've been able to do most successfully is um, is really stay in touch with with her, with Samantha, our customer, um, and talk about what her needs are. And the Colby jogger, like you mentioned, is is I think a really that's a, a really good example of one of the I think the the marketing create marketing creativity that can go into um, you know adapting to these changes. So um, the Colby pants were one of our best sellers even well before COVID too. Just they we call them origami suiting because um, you could fold them up and then just you know. Um, take them out on the other side and wear them without having to iron them, you know, at your, in your hotel room. And they're incredibly comfortable. They have these elastic waistbands. Um, and then when, when COVID hit, I mean, the sales for the, those pants just tanked, not entirely mm -hmm. surprisingly, like who's wearing, you know, they come with a, a matching jacket. Who's, who's wearing a suit right now. Um, <laughs> but we took those pants and we, we just rebranded them as Colby joggers because truthfully I wear those pants all the time at home. 
and um, suddenly sales for those particular pants, uh, you know, just skyrocketed. And now, I mean, they they were back to pre-COVID levels, maybe about um, two weeks after we changed the name. Uh, it was, I mean, that's the talk about another shocking moment. But yeah, you know, we it, it was a little bit of marketing creativity that that led to that. And so, um, I, I you know, I think we're we've always prided ourselves on comfort and practicality and machine washability. And it's really just tweaking that messaging a little bit so that our customers still feel that we're, we're relevant to her and her life right now. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh, those are all really great. Um, I think beyond, you know, expanding beyond the lens of COVID, are there any trends that you're seeing in fashion or e-com that you're particularly excited about? Um, you know, one of the things that I think ha it's been happening, I think, in fashion for a while, and it's just going to kind of keep pushing forward is I think women are, especially when I started MM, you know, um, there, there was more of a, the women must dress like one of the men mentality. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, just taking a broader look, I think Michelle Obama had a lot to do with pushing the envelope there. Um, I think people will remember, you know, when she did her official portrait, she did, um, she picked a dress that was sleeveless, which was really unheard of at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and now if you see a lot of women actually even on the campaign trail, um, they're, they're wearing a lot of dresses and bright colored dresses, uh, which really just was not happening, happening 10 years ago. People were wearing, you know, black, navy, gray suits, uh, suiting dresses, if you will. And um, one of the initiatives that that we actually launched um, earlier this year is this campaign called Ready to Run, where we offered um, to dress any any candidate who was running for office. We said female candidate, but, um, uh, you know, uh, open to um, men too. And we actually have um, transgender uh, candidates um, running as well who, who, who said to us, you know, I was like, I've, we've never had this service before. And so I, I really, I'm really looking forward to it. And so our stylists are working with these different candidates and saying, how can we dress you for, for your campaign? Um, and a lot of these women are gravitating towards these like really bright colored dresses, which makes me um, happy, you know, that we're not, um, I think, following the, the boys dress code. Um, yes. So, so that's been, I think, one just big change we'll see. I think women are not afraid to stand out um, uh, the way we may have been even 10 years ago. So looking forward to that change. Yeah, me too. I think it's uh, it's progress in many ways. So yeah. I'm looking for, for towards brighter a brighter future for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's a good tagline, Ivana. <laughs> Came up with it on the spot, you know, marketing savvy. Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I think with clothes, people are like, oh, clothes, what does clothes have to do with politics? But, you know, AOC actually tweeted about her or Instagrammed about her campaign. And she said, you know, a huge part of my running my campaign was getting um, my uh, my voters to imagine me in the role of Congresswoman. That's a huge part of what you're trying to do. And and so clothing yes. in sense, actually really is quite powerful. Um, I think it really has the power to affect the way not only the way other people see you, but the way you feel about yourself that day. Absolutely. Mm. Um, I want to so touch on your leadership philosophy with the last couple of minutes that we have. Um, I think especially in, in times of, you know, an economic and health crisis, strong leadership is truly paramount. And I know you're, you're a huge advocate of leading with compassion and something you call and I might butcher this, Kizukai, which yeah, is no, Japanese. No, I got it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Japanese for empathy and action, which mm -hmm. I think is so beautiful. So can you share a little bit more about your leadership philosophy? Um, sure. It's So the empathy and action, uh, just to elaborate on that a little bit more, um, you know, I think empathy and uh, uh, being a compassionate person is an essential part of being a good, I mean, human being, but I think also business person. And, you know, it's funny you're talking about marketing. I mean, I think marketing, what is it if not the ability to put yourself in your customer's shoes? So um, I, I think that's that's fundamental. And I think that that's true of any business. Empathy in action, the reason why we, you know, use this Japanese word instead of just saying empathy is because um, 
the, there, there's a slight nuance difference there. Um, Kizuka is about, you know, the example I often give is if someone walks into the office um, panting and looking really hot, um, an empathetic person would go up and say like, hey, how are you? Like, can I grab you a glass of water? Whereas the person mm -hmm. who displays Kizukai would just go and grab the glass of water. Mm, right? And so that that's the slight difference there. And I think, um, and, and such a big part of Japanese culture. Um, and also I think something that, that I um, really pride my, my team and my company uh, for having, um, I, I'm really, I, I, I have an incredible team. Um, I'm sure many leaders would say that, but I just, I, I am so, so fond of them and proud of them. And I think having worked in companies where I wasn't always happy to show up to work, where I didn't always like everyone that I was working with, you know, um, I think one thing that was really important to me was I wanted to come in every day and feel like, wow, this is an amazing group of people that I get to surround myself with. Um, good, these are good people that that I would, um, I would, I would trust so much with. Um, and, and I think when, so we have, you know, 10 company values, but when, when you pull um, any one of my employees, uh, I, I probably nine out of 10, 10 of them would say that that, that particular value Kizukai is, is the one that they love the most and the one that sets my company apart. Um, you know, we're, we're 80% female. Um, it, and, and I'm not saying that this is a particularly feminine characteristic or this is about, um, being a woman-led company, but I think it is about um, kind of uh, assuming best intent in other people and then also being able to um, help each other out uh, without kind of looking for reward or recognition, um, to be able to put yourself in that other person's shoes and say, like, what is it that I could be doing to make her day a little bit easier or to make her work a little bit easier? So, um that that I think is uh, a lot of it is in, informed by I think having um, had some experiences in the past that I that I where I felt like I couldn't be my best self, mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, I'm rambling, so I'll just pause. No, there. not at <laughs> all. I really appreciate your candor, yeah. and if anything, I'm I'm beaming, thinking we need more leaders like you, Sarah. Truly. Well, yeah. Always, you know. Always, um. Always a work in progress. I think just even around, um, you know, a, a lot of what's happening around the murder of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter. I, I'm learning a lot. I think, I think that's one thing. I think you you come in with a very strong um, notion of what you want your company to be, um, and you're always trying to communicate that and share that with your employees. And I still lead the values orientation for every single new hire orientation because um, that matters to me. But then, it, it, you know, that matters to me so much. Um, and then I think being able to really just take that to the next level and keep iterating and keep learning, that's so important. Um, I think, you know, while 2020 has been a disaster of a year. <laughs> I don't, least. Yeah, exactly. I think there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of learnings coming out of it. So, um, yes, definitely. I'm, I'm a work in progress, but, um, but I have a, I have a really amazing team to, to help me through it. Yeah. I mean, we're excited to see what you'll accomplish next. Um, so I have just one last question for you. And then we actually have quite an active, um, chat with, uh, questions coming in from the audience. So we'll go to those, uh, in a bit, sure. but just the last question here. What parting advice do you have for future entrepreneurs like yourself? Um, the, so maybe, maybe I'll start with a practical one. The practical one is to find yourself a side hustle. Um, mm -hmm. And so what I mean by that is that when I talk to a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, they say things like, well, I'm going to, or want to, uh, people who want to be entrepreneurs, I, I'm, I'm going to spend, I, I'm going to save X thousand dollars of doll, you know, thousand dollars before I go and quit and start my thing because I, I want to have, you know, I want to have some money, some cushion. Um, and I, I often say, well, if you're living in New York or San Francisco, there's no way you're going to save up enough money <laughs> to be able to do whatever it is that you want to do for the next two years. I mean, unless I think you're really, really frugal, it's a really, really tall order. So don't bother doing that, you know, go find Go find a side hustle that will let you pay your bills. Sure, you're not going to be able to live as extravagantly as you might be currently with a full-time job, but 
you know, for me, that was tutoring. So I was tutoring the SATs from, from 4 p.m. usually till 8 p.m. Um, Monday through Thursday. Um, and that's, that's how I paid rent and, you know, took care of my basic needs and got to work on MM for almost two and a half years without taking in an income. Um, so I think there's, again, like we go back to the VC conversation that, yeah. you know, all of these conversations about starting a business make it sound so impossible. Like you have to, you have to have VC backing and, and this kind of huge nest egg to get yourself started. But no, um, you don't like go, go tutor, go walk dogs, go be a barista. You know, there, there are a lot of ways to make money. Um, and I think sometimes when we're in the ivory towers of Bain or, you know, <laughs> or what have you, you forget that. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so that's just one practical advice I would give. Um, you know, the second one, which um, hate to be a cliche, but is just do it. Um, is I, th I think like again, uh, you know, it, it relates to the first comment, uh, the first piece of advice that I, that I shared. But there's, I think we have a tendency to over prepare, um, right? Like if you're working at Google, it's like you got there because you worked. You worked so hard and you prepared so much and you did so many things right. Um, and I think when it comes to startup world, you're going to try so many things and all, like so many things are going to fail. Nine, 99% of the things that you're going to try, are, you're going to fail at. And so what you really want is time. You want to, you want to give yourself a lot of time to do things. Um, I, you know, I would never even consider a business a failure um, unless you've really been at it for at least two to three years minimum. And so um, don't, don't over plan it. I would say just go and do it and you're going to learn so much in the process. Um, and so you can take yourself, take care of yourself financially, like go walk some dogs. <laughs> so, yeah. I'll leave it at that. I think that's sound advice. Um, so let's take a question from the audience. Sure. Um, we actually have a great one here, which is right on the nose. Uh, from Carly Rose. So she says, hi, Sarah, I love your brand. Happy customer here well, during you your entrepreneurial me. journey. What were some of the biggest obstacles you faced along the way and how did you overcome them? Um, yeah, biggest obstacles. I, I mean, funding and cash is truly one of the biggest ones. Um, I, I I think about when was I most anxious and the most anxious I was was when we were at, you know at multiple times especially in the early days about to run out of cash and yeah. um, I, I've shared this in a, a different uh, a podcast before but there was a point where our our checking account actually hit it went below zero and went to negative two thousand dollars and I didn't even know you could go below zero. Uh, but it turns out you can, and, and gosh, those were really, really stressful times. Um, so, um, what, I don't even know what the lesson is there. I mean, I, I, I wonder, I wonder if we could have done things differently, but I think to a certain extent, those were, I mean, that, that is kind of part of the startup journey is always, always being fearful that you're going to run out of money. Um, I think other things that have been stressful, um, Thinking again to like some of my more anxious moments is, is when I didn't necessarily have the the executive team that I needed around me. Um, I, I now have a an incredible president um, who is such a wonderful partner to me, um, a great COO, a great executive team, um, and they are they are very much in the foxhole with me. And so I think mm -hmm. I think those two things like if you have money and you have a great team that takes care of, I would say like a good portion of your anxiety. <laughs> um, so there you go. I think that's actually a perfect segue. There's another question here. I think, you know, related to, to finding a good team, but a question yeah. from Cassandra. Yeah. Um, do you have tips for picking a good headhunter? Oh, um, yes, I do. Um, we, we've used a variety and I would say um, it, it really comes down to like a, to a personality match. Um, I, I, I think this is true of actually working with a, a variety of agencies too, but yes, like working with a certain tier of agencies, I think, you know, guarantees some success, but it's really much more about the individual relationships. And so mm -hmm. Um, if you're thinking about working with a, a headhunter, I would just spend a lot of time with them up front. Um, 
like don't even really forget about the firm's name for a moment and and um and and just really see if you have that connection and, and if that person really understands what it is that you're looking for and and then also does that person write good emails because that's actually the most common form of initial outreach right and so right if that person someone who's just gonna kind of blast a hundred emails using the exact same script or you know do they you know, I think this is a, a good, this is just good, good sales 101, but does that person actually have a way of getting people to listen? Um, mm. the things that I would really look out for. Um, and I, I rarely think that the fee actually um, matches the quality. Um, you know, the person who found me, Miyako, um, he charged me $2,000 and it's still the best $2,000 I've ever spent. So <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, so 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 that would be my advice. And I think we have we might have time for two more. Um, but here's one from Anisha. Okay. Would love to know how MM LaFleur's brand is evolving to meet growing demand for more casual clothing mm. and athleisure that works in a work from home setting. Yeah, great question, Anisha. So I think one of the things that we were um that we spotted, you know, there's this working from home more casualization trend that's certainly acceler accelerated because of COVID, but I would say this was actually happening already maybe in 2015, 16, as we started to see more people moving into freelance culture, um, working from home, just being remote, being uh, an, uh, actually a possibility. And yeah. so um, I think it was in 2016, maybe 2017, Miyako and I actually went to, we spent some time in San Francisco just religiously interviewing a bunch of women. I'm sure many, many of them who worked in in uh, at Google or or in uh, at tech, in tech, um, saying, you know, what is it that you're really looking for? And it was actually it was fascinating. I think in some ways women in tech have it harder than women who are, for example, lawyers, where for whom the dress code is very clear. Um, what we were hearing a lot of is like, I don't want to wear hoodies to work. But if I wear a dress, people think I'm interviewing. So, like, mm. can you help me find um, a good um, what, what's the what's the go to uniform for women in tech? That was a, that was a lot of what we were hearing, and that um, led us to launch a collection in um, I want to say early 2018, which was um, and we started calling it Power Casual. Um, it, it's it's a very distinct look that I'm sure all of you women will know. Um, <laughs> which is, you know, it signifies that you are on trend, do you know what you're talking about? Um, you're you're um, very much of the zeitgeist, but you're not stuffy. And mm -hmm. um, it's a very delicate balance, I think. And so um, a lot of the sales, um, you know, the foster pants, which have been um, some of, well, it's been our best selling product for four years, but I know they're, they're one of the most coveted pop products by, by women in tech. Um, they have these pants that can ham, they, they have a hemming device so you can wear it short or you can wear it long. Um, it also doesn't have an elastic waistband. So your, um, your stomach can kind of expand with it. Um, the pants expand with your stomach. Uh, anyway, critical. So, yeah, critical, exactly. <laughs> um, so anyway, I think, um, and COVID has really only pushed that movement, I think, faster. But um, I'm I'm really happy that we already were kind of leaning in that in that uh, direction. Yep. Great. Um, and one last question, actually, from Marla. I think also along that vein, um, she says, "Thanks for joining us today. What was your big break that led to MM Lafleur to flourish and gain attention in the competitive fashion industry? Was it a specific mm -hmm. style that was created?" Yeah, this is a um, this is a great question. Gosh, and it's true. The fashion industry is so competitive. Um, you know, we had to basically beg our factories to work with us in the beginning because the barrier to entry is so low. You know, that their designers come and go. You know, one season after another. Um, I, honestly, the, I think the moment where we we felt like we actually st struck gold was when we launched Bento. Um, mm. That was. Uh, and, and I think we had, and I, I had mixed feelings about it because what I really wanted to be known for was our products. We take so much pride in the products that we make, um, and we really stand by the quality and the design and the fit. And what we actually got known for was more the the, the delivery mechanism, right? Yeah. 
but I think that, you know, that was actually good in, in some ways because it, it, it just, it was, um, it was something that was very of the moment. Um, that, that, that box model, which, um, by the way, we don't even do bento anymore. We have something called omakase where we, um, we show customers how to mix and match and wear the pieces differently, but we retired bento, um, about a little over a year ago now. And, um, it's, uh, it, it, but it was really good in the sense that it got customers to know about us. Um, and so, but it, it was, you know, I had mixed feelings initially because I remember people would say like, oh, Memo for that bento company. And I was like, but we make great clothes. <laughs> beyond that, yeah. yeah. Beyond the cardboard box here. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sarah, it's been such an honor to have you here with us today. I think we had a really great conversation. And uh, you know, just judging from the chats alone, I think everyone really enjoyed what you had to say. So wishing you the best of luck with everything that stands in the horizon for Emma LaFleur, as well as for yourself. And, you know, we'll be signing off here today. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, keep fighting the good fight, all of you Googlers. <laughs> yes. All right. Well. Take care. Uh, all right. Bye, guys. Bye now. See ya.